As we look at uh, these candles, we're not a church that typically lights candles every Sunday. It's not a part of our, our typical ritual. So why do we light candles this time of year? What is Advent? Well, Advent is a time of anticipation. And just the fact that, that there are five candles here, but we don't light all five the first week, causes a sense of anticipation. It, it causes a sense of, well, when are we going to do that? And we don't anticipate well in our world. We live in a world of instant gratification. If you want it, you get it now. At, at worst, you have to wait two days for Amazon to get it there. But Advent is a time of anticipation. It's a time of looking forward to Christ's coming. We tie it together with the Christmas season, but it's more than Christmas. It's more than just celebrating the first time that Jesus came. It's a reminder that He is coming again. And we anticipate, we look forward to that day when Christ comes again. Advent also reminds us that we participate in a bigger story than just us in our lives in this time and place. Advent reminds us that we're a part of a story that, that has, has gone back for at least 4,000 years, probably more than that. But that's the recorded version of it. It's this story that, that tells us we're a part of something bigger than just us. But Advent is also a recognition that things are not yet as they should be. And you don't have to look very far to see that. Our nation has entered a time of division where it doesn't matter what one side says, the other side says the opposite. I hope and pray that we will as a people be able to see past our politicians and learn how to live in harmony with one another. I hope and pray that we as a people would remember that our Messiah is not a political leader. Our Messiah is Jesus Christ. And His symbol is the lion and the lamb, not the donkey or the elephant. Advent is a recognition that things are not yet as they should be. And it's the hope that one day all will be made right. All the messes will be made right. All the brokenness, all the pain, it'll be made right. Advent reminds us of that hope. And so each year we light these candles, we grow through this progression of, of sermons, of of songs, of readings to remind us. Henry Nouwen said this, he said, The Lord is coming, always coming. When you have ears to hear and eyes to see, you will recognize Him at any moment of your life. Life is Advent. Life is recognizing the coming of the Lord. I got this quote in an email earlier this week and just kind of had it in front of me this week, reminding me that, that in all of the hustle and bustle and all the craziness of what we as Americans have made this season to be, that, that it's about the Lord coming. And we see Him coming, but we have to look for it. And just so you know, it's not going to come in a sales ad from Walmart or Target or Best Buy. His coming is in the way that we treat one another. His coming is in the way that we show His love to the world around us. His coming is, is represented in, in the way that we treat the cashier who's messed up our order three times. But as we show grace instead of anger, 
His coming is represented. What is Advent? Luke's Gospel does a really good job of of reminding us of this already and not yet. It reminds us in the story of the birth of Jesus. It reminds us throughout Jesus' ministry of the He's here, but it's not yet what we want it to be. And we see this as we approach the crucifixion. This almost, but not yet. Now with little kids, we experience that as we approach Christmas, right? When the gifts start to go under the tree and they start to shake them, and play with them, maybe peek at the wrapping. There's that anticipation of the gift is there, I just can't get it yet. And that's kind of what Luke's Gospel portrays for us is this Jesus has come, but it's not yet what we've all been waiting for. It's not yet what the people that Jesus interacted with were waiting for. They were looking for Jesus to be something different than what He was, and they knew it was coming. They anticipated that something new coming. There are five themes in Advent that kind of speak to this almost but not yet. The first is hope. That hope that it's not the way it should be, but it will be one day. And love. That even though people don't do the right things, we love them anyway because we have not done the right things and Jesus loved us anyway. Peace. We talked about this last week. Kind of ironic to talk about peace with all the kids running around. This gift of peace in the midst of the chaos, God gives us just this deep settled peace. And today we're going to be talking about joy, which is dependent upon peace. It's the only pink candle. Somebody a while back decided that, well, if we just make all the candles the same, they'll all blend together. And we need one to be a little bit more fun than the other. So they came up with a pink one. And then the fifth theme which we'll celebrate on Christmas Eve is the Christ candle. That reminder that all of this is about the coming of Christ. So what is joy? It's more than a pink candle. But I think we live in a world that that really struggles to understand joy. We struggle to understand what it means to experience true joy. Because everywhere we go, we're we're barraged with these images of we're not good enough. We're barraged with these images of you've got to buy this if you want to really feel joy. And you've got to have this And even though you bought this last year, you got to have this one this year. And it's never ending. What is joy? It's It's a word that we use a lot. We sing about it. Yesterday as I was working on this sermon, I just typed joy into my iTunes music and it pulled up probably 50 to 100 songs and and I just played through the songs with joy in the title. And some of them had something to do with Christmas and some of them didn't. But we do typically sing about this a lot at this time of year, the, the songs of joy. What is joy? 
One scholar that I read defined it this way. Joy is closely related to gladness and happiness, although joy is more of a state of being than an emotion. As a result of, cho- as a result of choice, we choose joy. And it's one of the fruits of the Spirit from Galatians 5. And having joy is a part of the experience of being a Christian. It struck me this week that of our candles, love is a fruit of the Spirit, joy, peace, they're fruits of the Spirit. It's that work that God's Spirit does in us as we make the decision to follow Christ. Hope is the only one that's not one of the fruits of the Spirit, but it's kind of what opens us up to that working of the Spirit in us. Joy is often confused with gladness and happiness. It's close. But have you ever noticed how you can be happy one moment and angry the next? Try driving anywhere in this town right now. You can feel joyful because this wonderful song is on the radio and then they've got the road closed. And people don't know how to merge. Some people don't. Joy is not an emotion as much as it is a state of being. A person who is joyful is a person who can smile and laugh when everything is going the wrong way. I'll be honest with you, this is not the fruit of the Spirit that is the most frequently evident in my life. It's one that I pray for, but it's not the one that people meet me and say, oh, he's such a joyful guy. I don't think anybody has ever described me that way. But it is a part of that Spirit's working in us that says that all the stuff that we're being barraged with doesn't have to destroy what God is doing in us. I think joy is very closely related to peace. That as I experience the peace of God in my heart, then I can be open to be joyful because I know who's in charge and it's not me. And I know His working in me And I know His working in everything that's taking place around me. And I don't have to take me so seriously. And so I can laugh at me instead of taking me so seriously. Joy is a state of being. But it's what the Spirit builds in us as we open ourselves up to his working now some people just have a joyful personality they're born with it my youngest can be this way she's just excited all the time about everything my question every morning is to remember what she was excited about and when i pick her up from school remember if she's still excited about what she was excited about that morning she she just bubbles she's just joyful and her dad is not But even though it's not natural for me, it is a part of what the Spirit works in to develop in me. And you never know, maybe by the time I'm Bob's age, if I ever reach 185, (laughs) people might describe me as joyful, and maybe it'll be because I'm just out of it and don't have a clue what's going on, and I'm just joyful. Dorothy's still waiting on that, isn't she? (laughs) We are to be growing and being shaped, being formed in this area of joy. 
Another scholar said this. He said, because the early Christians believed that the advent of Jesus marked the inbreaking of God's final redemptive act, all the eschatological joy that Israel had anticipated was now associated with Jesus. So all of the joy that Israel had waited for was now tied up in the person of Jesus. And this motif is particularly strong in Luke's Gospel, where the birth of the infant Jesus occasions an outpouring of human and heavenly joy. And his ministry and his resurrection evoke the same response. As we read through the Gospel of Luke, we see joy frequently as, as the way that people responded to the ministry of Jesus. It's the way that they responded to his birth. They responded to his miracles. They responded to the resurrection through joy. And as we journey through Luke's gospel, we, we see this. And that's why there's so many Christmas songs that have to do with joy. It certainly is not about the shopping experience that brings joy. It's, it's not about waiting in line and the traffic. and It's about Jesus. We also see this the second time that Jesus' arrival was celebrated. And I had never put these two stories together, but because this was our reading for this last week, I saw that in the, in the New Testament, there's only two times that Jesus allowed the people to celebrate. Him. The first was at his birth. And the second is what we call the triumphal entry. And typically this is our Palm Sunday text, but because we're reading through the Gospel of Luke right now, it's what we read last week. So we're going to read it this morning. So if you have your Bibles and you want to open up with me to Luke chapter 19, and we're going to start with verse 36. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. And when he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to sit, shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying stuff like that. But Jesus replied, they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. Now, this is kind of an exciting event for the people of Jerusalem. Jesus was coming. The crowds had been waiting to welcome Jesus like this because it meant that something was about to happen. Something was finally going to happen. Jesus had always snuck in and out of Jerusalem. In fact, there's one story where even his brother, brothers didn't even know that he was coming, and he just kind of showed up. He snuck in and out. He wouldn't let the crowds celebrate him. In fact, whenever the crowds with political ambitions gathered, he would disappear. Maybe that would be a lesson for us today in America, at least in Iowa in this caucus season. Whenever the crowds with political ambition gathered, they were ready to make him king, and he would disappear. When he healed someone, he told them, don't tell anybody what I did. Don't tell anybody it was me. Go and tell no one. But this time was different. He allowed the crowds to welcome him. In fact, he set up the fact that he would be riding in on the colt of a donkey that had never been written before. And it was a prophecy being fulfilled from the Old Testament. And everybody knew what that meant. He set it up. And he allowed the crowds to welcome him. And he even told the Pharisees who were having a fit, if they don't do it, then the rocks are going to cry out. Joy was the emotion of the day. Everybody was so joyful. Everybody was so excited. Something was about to happen. 
Now here's the deal. What was about to happen was not what those crowds thought was going to happen. Those crowds had this idea in their mind that the only purpose for Jesus coming, the Messiah was prophesied, he was coming so that he could wipe out the Romans and restore Jerusalem and restore the Jews to their place of power in the world. That they would then be what they used to be, the boss. That everybody would bow down to them and people would come from all across the world to to praise them. And the crowds thought, it's finally going to happen. We're going to see Jesus destroy the Romans. And what better military leader could you find? Think about some of the miracles of Jesus. When somebody was dead, he healed them. He raised them back to life. You would have a never-ending supply of soldiers. If you didn't have food, he could make food multiply and take nothing and make something of it. You wouldn't even have to have people carry the food because he could make the food come from nowhere. He could control the weather. Remember the story of Jesus walking on water and the, the storm that was overwhelming the disciples when Jesus just said, peace, be still, and all of a sudden the raging waves were calm. This text tells us that the people were were getting excited as they thought about all of the miracles that they had seen. These miracles that said there's nobody that can lead us as a military leader like Jesus can. He can do it all. And we are completely invincible with him as our military leader. Joy was the emotion of the day. But the joy was placed in the wrong place. That happens to us sometimes too, doesn't it? We get so excited about things that turn out to be a bust. As a Colts fan, I'm experiencing that this year. I know what it feels like to be a Bears fan. It's depressing, isn't it? Don't know how you guys have done it for so long. As the people were coming into town surrounding Jesus, they were quoting from Psalm 118 and and quoting from this psalm that had this kingly status to it that reminded people of David coming into Jerusalem. And interestingly, the angels had quoted from this psalm when Jesus was born. As the angels went to the the fields to announce to the shepherds that Jesus had been born. They quoted the same psalm. If you look at the story in Luke chapter 2, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And then 1938, blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. Similar, but there's a little difference. Actually, it's a striking difference if you think about it. And Luke is the only one of the gospel writers who record this. Even though all four gospels record this story, Luke is the only one that records this difference. The angels... Proclaim peace on earth. But the crowds said peace in heaven. Peace on earth is the message that the angels came to bring. Peace in heaven is what the crowds were saying. Which leads to a difficult question. Why would they say that differently? Maybe. 
we have to ask this question. Were the crowds exchanging the gift of God, which was peace on earth, for what they wanted to happen? A revolution that expelled the Romans from Israel. Were they exchanging the peace that God came to bring for what they wanted more than God's gift? Peace on earth versus peace in heaven. And I read a number of scholars this week, more than I normally do, trying to get an answer to this question. And none of the scholars really agreed on what would cause them to write this way or say this versus what the angels had said. They all drew the connection between what the angels said. But my wondering is, were they willing to trade their joy for a victory that would not last? Were they willing to trade the gift of God in Jesus Christ, peace on earth, for what they thought they wanted instead? Something that historically had been proven to not last over and over and over. The Old Testament is the story of, of the, the Israelite people being chosen by God, being rescued by God again and again and again. And every time God rescued them, they turned their backs on Him and didn't follow through. Every time that, that God moved in their midst and rescued them through miraculous circumstances, they turned their backs on Him and got in the same position again. Was this generation of Jews thinking that they should turn away from the gift that God came to bring? They didn't want peace on earth. They wanted war on earth. They wanted war led by this person. Were they turning away from the gift of God in order to receive what they wanted, but what wouldn't last. And I wonder if maybe we don't do the same thing today. Do we trade our joy to chase after an ideal Christmas? Do we trade in the joy and the peace that God came to bring to chase after something that isn't going to last and probably isn't going to happen anyway? I asked Janelle last night, is like, does it just seem like this year has been more crazy than normal? And she said, no, it's always this crazy. You're just paying attention this year. <laughs> she didn't say it nearly sarcastically as that. She was very <laughs> gentle about it. But... Maybe I've just been driven by more adrenaline in past years, and this year I'm just saying, man, this just doesn't seem right. Maybe as I get older, I don't have as much adrenaline to get me through this time of year, but are we trading true joy to chase after what the world tells us, that if we buy this gift, this gift, this gift, and that gift, that we would have joy? What if we could have it without buying all that stuff? What if we could have it without having to go through all of the work that we go through? Do we trade our joy for something that will only last a few hours? I learned very early that the toys that I thought the girls would enjoy the most lasted the smallest amount of time. It's amazing how quick some toys could get broken. And that was before we had a dog to chew them up. And it's amazing how quickly they would lose interest in toys and be more infatuated with the boxes that they came in. Do we trade joy 
for something that's only going to last a few hours. Which leads to this question. What if we didn't? What if we decided to seek joy? What if we said, you know what? It's not worth all that we're going through and the anger that erupts in us when things don't go the way that they should and they never go the way that they should. Friday night, Janelle and Olivia were working on a project and so Ava and I went shopping and Ava had one place she wanted to go. She wanted to go to Hobby Lobby. She had some gifts in mind and we knew this is where we needed to go. It's like, okay, we've got these errands to run first. So we had to go to this store and this store and this store and this store and this store. And we finally got to Hobby Lobby and we walk in the door and it's like, Ava, I've really got to use the restroom because, you know, we've been to this store, this store, this store, this store, and that coffee. Um, And so as I walk into the restroom, I hear the announcement. Good evening, Hobby Lobby shoppers. Just letting you know the time is now 7.55 and Hobby Lobby will be closing in five minutes. Ava is not a shopper that can say, okay, I know what I want and I want to get it now and get out the door. Ava is a shopper that wants to look at everything. She takes it all in. And we had not even talked about what she wanted there. I thought she wanted one section and then she actually wanted another section and I came out of the restroom four minutes and let's go. And it didn't go well. And when the announcement came along that said 8 o'clock and we're now closed and we walked out the door with nothing and we sat in the car and I had to face this choice. It's like, okay, I blew it. I know what time Hobby Lobby closes because usually I'm sitting in the car waiting while Janelle's inside shopping and I'm counting down the hours till Hobby Lobby closes. And I spaced it. And Ava's a joyful kid. It's like, okay, Lord, I need some joy here. (laughs) And so they go, Ava, let's look at your list. What is on your list? Because she went to a different apartment than I was looking for. And and we were able to salvage the evening. But it wasn't because everything went right. It was because we said, okay, this is frustrating. It didn't go the way we wanted it to. But let's choose joy instead. So nobody got gifts from Ava from Hobby Lobby. They're coming from somewhere else. Which added more stores to my list. But what if we decided that we weren't going to get so focused on having everything go perfect and we said, you know what, this is what happened, let's be joyful in this. Jesus didn't come to give us headaches from the stores. He came to give us joy. And it had nothing to do with stores. Target had not been invented when Jesus came. Jesus had nothing to do with Walmart. He did not own stock in Walmart and say, how can I boost this value? What if we chose to seek joy instead? What if we decided to protect our souls and protect our hearts and our minds and our lives by not having to buy everything that the world tells us we have to have. What if we didn't have to listen to the advertisers? What if we just said, you know what? What God wants to do in here is more important than what the stores tell me I need. What if my trips to those stores do not bring up the list of the fruit of the spirits in my life? There's a list before that of stuff that you shouldn't do. That's what comes out in me when I go into those stores. (laughs) What if, what if we protected our souls? What if we protected joy? What if we didn't buy into this idea that everything has to be perfect? What if we put more energy into things that will last, like relationships? Spending time with people. 
that's the only thing that really came out of Ava and I's shopping trip is we got to spend time together all over town. But that was more important than the gifts that we bought. What if we didn't trade our souls for something that won't last? As the worship team comes and as we prepare to close, I just want to encourage us to think about this question. Advent reminds us of hope and love and joy and peace. And just so you know, these go in a different order. There's no set order because I switched joy and peace. What if we sought those things in our lives rather than the perfect Christmas? What if we were more concerned with putting energy into things that would last than trying to make everything go perfect and losing our relationships in the process? Let's stand together as we close with a song, Joy to the World.